The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, showing up today, signing up for the webinar. Uh, I'm going to thank also to John Sigenthaler. Um, he's our presenter today, and um, I would like to say he leads the industry in forward-thinking uh, designs and the systems based on uh, solid engineering principles. And um, Hydronix 23, which is uh, mainly what Siggy's going to be talking about today, is uh, it's on the streets. It's mailed out, so keep an eye out for that. If you don't see it within the next couple days or week, uh, let us know or, or maybe go to the site and uh, make sure that we've got all your information, your mailing address, and everything is current and, and correct or something like that. Sometimes you have to re-up on the uh, sign in there, but uh, it, it should be coming to you. So let us know if you're not getting them or if you aren't signed up, uh, certainly go to that site there and uh, sign up. I think that's it. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, Bob, uh, and thank you folks for joining us. I know we've got a good-sized audience. Uh, I know we've had uh, several questions submitted prior to today. Uh, we appreciate you getting those, and I'm going to try to address some of those as we go through today's uh, topics. Uh, we will have some time at the end for other questions, so as, as we proceed, uh, make sure you uh, uh, type them in if you have them. Uh, I won't read all this to you. These are the topics that we're going to be talking about. Heat transfer is a very large, very broad subject. So what we've done with uh, this webinar and also with Hydronics 23 is we've tried to look at the practical application of heat transfer principles within the context of hydronic systems. So we'll be looking at conduction, convection, and radiation heat transfer. Uh, we're also going to look at some very specific stuff within hydronics, such as how flow rate and delta T affect uh, the rate of heat transfer. Uh, we'll look at uh, constrained delta T situations where we have a control device that holds a delta T at a constant value, and we'll see some applications where that works. Uh, we'll also look at the advantages of high delta T, and you see the word over here, exploiting high delta T situations. High delta T or a high temperature drop in a hydronic system is analogous to high voltage in an electrical system. Uh, you can do a lot, uh, you can do a lot of work or move a lot of energy with relatively low flow rates, which means smaller pipes, smaller circulators, when you have a high delta T. So we'll look at some applications on that. Uh, thermal equilibrium is another very universal principle in hydronics. It's, it's a very simple idea. It essentially says that any hydronic system with, without control intervention will seek a condition where the rate of heat generation is equal to the rate of heat dissipation. And the temperature of the water in the system will simply move towards a condition where that, those two rates of heat transfer are equal. And then we're going to look at uh, another practical aspect here. What happens when you have a high temperature distribution system? Perhaps it was pin tube baseboard that was designed in the 1950s, 1960s in a house. Maybe it was designed around 190 degree water. Uh, what happens now when you want to put a lower temperature heat source in, like a heat pump or maybe some solar thermal collectors? What are your options for modifying that distribution system to bring the water temperature requirement down? And then finally, we're going to wrap up. We're going to take a basic look at heat exchangers, um, concepts like log mean temperature difference, counter flow, and uh, keeping the heat exchanger surface clean. So we've got a lot, and that's why, uh, as Hot Rod was mentioning, we've got 90 minutes, so hang in there. There, there's a there's a photo from one of my last training sessions. You see what one guy there is doing good. So let's start in with conduction. Uh, conduction heat transfer is fundamentally comes down to molecular vibrations. When the temperature of a material increases, the the frequency or the um, amplitude of the vibrations of those molecules increase. And if if you can imagine a bunch of uh, ping pong balls just jostling back and forth. As you add more ping pong balls to the bin, those vibrations are going to get transferred. And that's essentially at a, an atomic level how thermal energy moves through a solid material. And there's, there's an equation that is used to model that. It's, it's a very classic equation. 
uh, it says that the rate of heat transfer by conduction, essentially it's directly proportional to something called thermal conductivity. It's just a material property. Copper has a very high thermal conductivity. Something like polyurethane foam has a very low conductivity. But whatever that value is, the rate of heat transfer with all other conditions being equal, directly proportional to it. It's also directly proportional to temperature difference. Think about temperature difference as the driving force for heat transfer. Without a delta T, you don't have heat transfer. And that's true for both, well, for conduction, convection, as well as, as radiation. You have to have a temperature difference to move thermal energy. And then you see the delta X down here in the bottom of the equation. That's the thickness of the material. The thicker it is, the slower the rate of heat transfer. So obviously if you use a eight inch thick bat of fiberglass insulation in a wall versus the four inch thick bat, you have twice the thickness. In theory, you would have half the heat transfer rate by conduction. Now, another form of that basic conduction equation is uh, it's a modification that shows the R value of a material. And, and I like this equation because when you look at any kind of insulating product, fiberglass, foam, anything like that, uh, you're dealing with R values rather than K values. Uh, you know, any given material would have both, but R values are, are more commonly used to describe insulating materials or building materials. So uh, the R value of a material is just its thickness divided by its thermal conductivity. And with either of these equations, and, and this is true really with any equation we look at, uh, make sure the units that you're working with are, are uh, compatible. So we're using all classic uh, North American units here. Okay. Now, uh, I mentioned that thermal conductivity is a material property. And just, just as an illustration, over on the lower right there, that's, a, um, that's an infrared thermograph of a building. And you can see the temperature scale over on the far right. It was taken in the wintertime. And what's very obvious there is where the studs in the wall are. And you can see that the, the studs are a, a brighter color, a, a redder color compared to the, uh, the purple color between the studs. And that's because they conduct heat better to the outside. The, the outside surface temperature of the wall is actually higher where there's a stud in the wall compared to where there's an insulating bat in the wall. And uh, just for comparison down at the bottom here, I looked up the uh, thermal conduct activity of wood and compared it to fiberglass insulation. It's about a three to one ratio. And again, that, that shows up in that infrared thermogram as a higher surface temperature on that exterior wall where the studs are. You know, one of the, the best ways to tell people about conduction is say, well, take a, a coffee mug and just you know, fill it up with warm coffee and put your hands around it. You can feel heat from the coffee conducting through the wall of the mug and, and making over to your hands. Um, now here's a situation that is very applicable in our, our industry. This is a, a heated floor slab. And what you're looking at here is just a segment of the slab and you can see the tube there in the middle. That's a half inch PEX tubing and a four inch concrete slab. There's an inch of polystyrene foam underneath it. And then uh, we're assuming a 3 8 inch oak floor bonnet to the top of the slab. And if you look within the slab, you'll see these contour lines. And these are called isotherms. What an isotherm is, is a, a line or a curve that represents a given temperature. So for example, this isotherm that I'm tracing with the cursor, every point along that line has the same temperature. Uh, I don't actually have them labeled here, but uh, an isotherm uh, gives you an indication of how that heat moves by conduction from the tube out through these different materials. And again, these materials have widely varying values of thermal conductivity. So you see that there's, there's changes in, for example, where the isotherm hits the wood floor here. Now, one of the things that we've done several years ago is we did a study where we compared different types of tubing embedded in a concrete slab. Well, we compared PEX, PEX aluminum PEX, copper, and, and a rubber tube. 
and we we looked at uh, the thermal conductivities of the tube and tried to assess how much of an effect would a high thermal conductivity tube have on the overall heat transfer from the slab. And just to give you a uh, kind of a setup for this, the thermal conductivity of copper is, is almost a thousand times greater than that of a PEX tube. So the, the question would be, since we're, let's say we're contemplating using a copper tube in that slab versus a PEX tube, would it produce 941 times more heat output from the floor? And the answer is actually no, no, it doesn't. In fact, here's a graph based on this finite element model, and it shows that, yes, the copper tube does produce a higher heat output, but not a lot higher, roughly about 15% higher. And I know one of the questions that was submitted prior to the webinar asked about uh, the difference in heat transfer rate between PEX tubing and PEX aluminum PEX tubing. And it's very, very small. Um, I don't show it on this graph, but literally it probably is on the order of maybe 1% uh, better at most for the PEX aluminum PEX. The aluminum layer it, it does improve things a little bit, but it's, it's very small. And the takeaway from this slide is that even though that copper tube is much higher thermal conductivity, it's the combination of all the materials and how they're put together that determines the overall performance of that slab. So uh, adding or changing to a copper tube in that slab, it does improve it slightly, but nowhere as near as much as you might think based on what the conductivity is relative to PEX tubing. Now, here's another situation that comes up a lot. Um, what, what I refer to as a plateless staple up system. And that photo right there is an example where we're looking up at the underside of a floor deck. You can see the uh, half inch tubing there that's been stapled to the underside of the subfloor, uh, roughly eight inches on center. And I'm gonna contrast that with the system down at the bottom, half inch tubing again, uh, eight inches on center, but this has six inch wide aluminum plates on it. So how much of an effect, how much of a benefit will adding those aluminum plates have compared to just leaving them out? So again, we, we model this with finite element analysis software, and the, the graphics here show what's going on. Again, you look at these different regions uh, from red uh, going through uh, different shades out to that, that blue color. Those represent regions of uh, temperature. Now, it isn't a single temperature. It might be a band of temperature that's no more than, let's say, three or four degrees wide. But it's very obvious up here that the plate, even though it's a thin plate, it's on the order of 20 thousandths of an inch thick, aluminum has a high thermal conductivity. So it's acting like a wick. It's diffusing the heat out away from the tube, spreading it out across the floor, which is very important. If, if we're trying to get more of a uh, consistent floor surface temperature, we, we don't want to create hot spots directly above the tube and then have the temperature drop off quickly on both sides. And that's really what's going on down here. And we've come up with a term, we call it thermal constipation. Uh, we'd say that lower system or the plateless system in this case is a thermally constipated system. Uh, we can put a lot of heat into that tube. We could put 150, 160 degree water in there if we wanted to, but the combination of the different materials and the different thermal conductivities of those materials, as well as the geometry of how they're put together. Think about a round tube against a flat surface. It's, it's very, very limited contact. And that assumes that the tube is in, indeed in contact with the surface. Uh, if you look at the photograph over here, imagine 150, 160 degree water in that PEX tubing. That tubing is going to expand and it's going to become uh, more flexible than when it's at room temperature. So it's going to droop away from the, and that, that would cut pretty much any conductivity other than perhaps directly where it's stapled to the floor. Uh, this is not a system that I, I uh, would recommend to you. In fact, I, at the bottom there, I highly recommend avoiding plate staple up radiant panels. 
Uh, we've spent uh, collectively, uh, I think uh, Bob and I have probably spent what, 35 or 40 years in our industry. And both of us, as well as I'm sure many people that are uh, viewing today, have seen these systems and we've, we've seen some real disappointments with these. So uh, conduction is important in a radiant floor system or radiant panel system in general. And uh, again, those plates are there to enhance conduction. They, they don't reflect, they don't uh, really do much as far as convection, but they do a lot as far as conducting heat away from the tube, spreading it out across the floor. So we'll move to con Convection and convection is heat transfer that is caused by the movement of a fluid and the term fluid here could could mean a liquid like water or a gas like air and uh, There's a couple categories that uh, we look at with convection uh, one is called forced convection Forced convection is when you have a mechanical device either a circulator or a blower that is forcing the fluid to move and you're, you're getting higher flow velocities, and that's very important in convection. The faster that fluid moves across the surface, the better the heat transfer rate is going to be. So, for example, here we have a circulator, and it's pumping hot water from a heat source through a coil in a, in a tank. Inside that coil, on the inner surface of that coil, we have forced convection heat transfer. But on the outer surface of that coil, there's no circulator You're forcing that fluid. Uh, any movement of the fluid on the outer surface of that coil is caused by uh, buoyancy differences. As you heat a fluid, it expands, its density decreases, and it tends to rise. And that movement is very gentle, very slow compared to the, the movement created by force convection. So on the inside force convection, on the outside natural convection, Here's a couple other photos that, that illustrate natural convection. Uh, this one is just, uh, this is what's called a Schlieren photograph. And it, it has to do with how air is, um, how the diffraction of light is changed as the temperature of the air changes. But those waves that you can see above that hand are simply motion. Those waves represent motion of the air due to heat convecting off of that hand. Okay, that there's no blower or fan or circulator involved. Uh, the photo over on the right here is actually, a, it's a towel warmer. And you can see the towel warmer is, is warm. It has hot water going through it. But uh, it was kind of an interesting photo. I actually took this with a FLIR camera. And what you can see there is that bluish area up above the towel warmer and especially up on the ceiling. And it shows the result, e even though what we're, actually photographing our surface temperatures. Those surface temperatures were created by natural convection, the rising air current coming off that towel warmer, going up the wall, and then diffusing out across the ceiling there. So again, distinguishing between forced convection and natural convection. In general, forced convection is, is a much more, uh, how should I say, aggressive form of convection or heat transfer compared to natural convection. There's a lot of situations in, in heating systems where both of these forms of convection are present. And you'll see that uh, without question, forced convection will allow you to do more with a smaller surface area compared to natural convection. Now, the, the equation to estimate the rate of heat transfer by convection, it's pretty simple. You come up with what's called the convection coefficient. Uh, now, I, I said the equation is simple. Well, it's yes, three things multiplied together. But getting this first one, this convection coefficient, this can be a challenge. Uh, there are many geometries and different scenarios with different fluids where it becomes actually fairly complex to come up with an estimated value for the convection coefficient. And it varies widely. I, I put some values down over here, natural convection involving air, what the convection coefficient would be uh, compared to forced convection involving air. And you can see it could be, uh, not only does it vary over a wide range, it can be uh, forced convection can 
create much higher on the order of 20 times higher values for the uh, convection coefficient compared to natural convection, okay? In general, the faster the fluid is moving, the higher that convection coefficient is going to be. Um, a is just the area between which the, the moving fluid and the solid come in contact. And uh, delta T here would be the temperature difference between what we call the bulk fluid temperature. Not, that's not the temperature of the fluid right at the surface, but it's the temperature perhaps two or three centimeters in where you have a, a fairly stable condition. Uh, so the equation is simple, but sometimes using that equation, gathering the information you need to use that equation can be kind of complicated. Uh, forced convection, more potent uh, mode of heat transfer. Now, here's a good example in hydronics. Um, that upper heat emitter right here, this is a small fan coil, it's two feet wide. And I just looked up the specs on it. Uh, it'll produce just under 10,000 BTs per hour of heat output with a 170 degree Fahrenheit average water temperature and about 100 CFM airflow going through it. So think about that, 10,000 BTUs per hour with a two foot wide heat emitter. Now to produce that same output with thin tube would require over 24 feet of standard residential thin tube. And that's based on uh, 410 BTUs per hour per foot of thinned element. Again, assuming 170 degree average water temperature. So what's the difference? How can a 24 inch wide fan coil produce as much output as 24.4 feet of thin tube baseboard. Again, it lies in the difference between forced convection and natural convection. On the air side of the fan coil, we have a blower. We have forced convection. We have much higher heat transfer coefficients. On the fin side or the air side of a baseboard, we have no blower. We have just natural convection. So that is very much the limiting factor in heat transfer rate. If we were to create a, a blower that was 24.4 feet wide and, and blow air across that, uh, that fin tube, we would have much, much higher rates of heat output. Kind of impractical though to have a 24 foot wide blower. So just uh, again, why, why do the heat outputs uh, vary so much uh, based on uh, convection, a, a lot of times it's the difference between natural and forced convection. Now, um, another question that comes up quite a bit in, in hydronics, one, one that I've heard many times and I've seen it posted, uh, what's the effect of flow velocity on heat transfer? Uh, one school of thought is the water can move too fast through a heat emitter. And if it moves too fast through the heat emitter, the heat doesn't literally have time to come away from the water and transfer out into the room through the heat emitter. And actually that's not correct. So what's going on inside a tube when you have flow, uh, what's called stable established flow, is if we look inside this tube, we get what's called a velocity profile. And these little arrows represent the flow velocity. And you can see that the arrow right at the center is the longest. Okay, the fluid is actually moving faster down the center line of that tube than it is perhaps 25% uh, of the diameter away from the tube wall, starting to slow down. And it really slows down at the tube wall itself. And there's a very thin layer, and you can, you can barely see it in this diagram, but that little purple layer right here, right between the, the edge of the fluid, if you will, and the inside surface of the tube, that's called a boundary layer. And the boundary layer is a, it's a thin layer of fluid that acts, if you will, as an insulator. It acts to inhibit heat transfer between the bulk of the fluid stream and the wall of that tube. The thicker the boundary layer is, the lower the heat transfer coefficient is going to be. And converse, if the boundary layer can be made thinner, you're going to have higher rates of heat transfer. Now, what controls the thickness of that boundary layer uh, for a given fluid, for a given viscosity, you know, given fluid, a given temperature, is basically the speed. The faster the fluid moves down through that tube, the thinner the boundary layer is going to be, 
and hence the better the rate of heat transfer is going to be. And here's an example with some fin tube. And all I did here is I took uh, the same piece of fin tube and I start off here with a inlet temperature of 180 degrees and a flow rate of one gallon per minute. Okay. And um, I forgot the actual length of the fin tube here, but we modeled that uh, a specific length of fin tube and we got an outlet temperature of 145. So our um, average water temperature in that tube is 162.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. And we have a certain rate of heat transfer, about 16,980 BTUs per hour. Now, we'll take the same piece of fin tube, same supply water temperature, but we're going to boost the flow rate up to four gallons per minute. All right. So all we're changing is the flow rate. And uh, again, we, we have a very detailed engineering model of fin tube that we've used for years. Uh, the output temperature, you can see, is actually higher now. So the delta T has decreased for sure. But remember that delta T is only one factor that factors into rate of heat transfer. Flow rate is the other factor. Our average water temperature now, based on 180 in, 168.7 out, has gone up to 174. Increasing the average water temperature in any heat emitter will increase its heat output. So we've gone from roughly 17,000 to roughly 22,000 BTUs per hour, simply by increasing the flow rate. No change in water temperature. We've made the boundary layer thinner. We got better heat transfer. So let's keep going. Let's, let's bump it up now to eight gallons per minute. Exact same piece of fin tube. Uh, our outlet temperature does increase, uh, not quite as much as it did before. Our average temperature went up a little bit, uh, I'll say in rough about three degrees Fahrenheit. Our output went from 22,000 roughly to about 23,000. So you can see we're continuing to increase the rate of heat transfer as we increase flow rate, but we're also seeing a diminishing rate of increase. In other words, yes, it's going up, but it's going up smaller and smaller amounts as we keep uh, increasing the flow rate. And keep in mind in a hydronic system, from a heat transfer standpoint only, higher flow rates, the higher the flow rate, the better the heat transfer. But we also have to be concerned about pumping power. When we double a flow rate through a fluid circuit, in theory, we have eight times the pumping power. So we, you know, we're, we're gaining in a heat transfer standpoint, but we're definitely losing in, in terms of the uh, energy that it takes to move a fluid at that speed. And of course, there's other factors like excess flow velocity that can cause noise, it can cause erosion of the pipe, and so forth. But this does demonstrate that going to higher flow rates will increase heat transfer. And here's, a, I just took these numbers out of a rating table for some residential baseboard. You can find ratings for one GPM and four GPM flow rates in most residential baseboard specifications. And I, I've never seen a case where this doesn't apply. The heat output is always incrementally higher at the higher flow rate. And again, it's, it's because higher flow rates produce higher heat transfer coefficients and that produces better convection. You can see it goes up a little. It goes from 150 to 160 here. If we go up to higher temperatures, 550 up to 580, we're getting a small increase, 6 7%, something like that. Which is, which is good, but again, four GPM versus one GPM, that, that's a much higher um, pumping power requirement. So it's a trade-off. It's a trade-off between flow rate and, um, uh, well, pumping power and heat transfer. So summary, heat transfer rates always increase with increasing flow velocity because of the thinning of the boundary layer and the increase in the convection coefficient. And I also want to show you that that effect is very, what we call nonlinear. In other words, doubling the flow rate does not double the rate of heat transfer. Tripling the flow rate doesn't triple the rate of heat transfer. That would be a proportional relation. What, what I've got here is just based on some rating data for a small fan coil. And it, it is at a fixed supply water temperature, uh, probably 180 degrees. 
And I just plotted some points and drew a curve through them. And it, it shows that at very low flow rates, you can see a rapid increase in heat output. But the higher the flow rate becomes, the, the, the heat output continues to go up, but it goes up at a diminishing rate. And that's also true with other hydronic heat emitters. Here's a, a, a radiant floor slab circuit that we've modeled. It's a 300 foot circuit of half inch PEX tubing in a slab. Uh, again, holding the water temperature at a fixed value and just varying the flow rate. Uh, you see a rapid increase in heat transfer at low flow rates and then a, di a diminishing return as we go to higher flow rates. Uh, so the, these are reasons behind things like um, equal percentage balancing valves. The idea of trying to create a valve so that we can get a linear or approximately linear relationship between heat output and flow rate. You can't do that with a standard valve like a globe valve or a ball valve. Uh, you need a, a characterized valve with what's, what's called an equal percentage characteristic to do that. So we've talked about conduction, convection. Let's move on to radiation. This is probably the least understood because um, it, you know, it doesn't involve a material necessarily uh, as far as um, a material through which the heat has to move. Radiation heat transfer is how we get energy from the sun through 93 million miles of nothing, basically. So what are some of the characteristics? Well, any surface will emit thermal radiation to any cooler surface within sight of it. So your skin is, let's say today, in the summer day, your skin temperature, probably in the mid 80s. And if, if there was a surface around you at 75 degrees, maybe a window or a wall, you're actually radiating energy, electromagnetic energy from your skin to that cooler surface. Uh, travels at the speed of light. Uh, it, it can move through air, but it do doesn't require any material. That's what really sets it aside from conduction and convection. And the other thing to realize, thermal radiation becomes heat the instant that radiation is absorbed at a surface. So we could have sunlight traveling 93 million miles and it hits a driveway. And the moment that radiation hits that driveway, uh, that radiation changes and it becomes heat stored within that material. And over on the right, just some more thermal images of, um, that's actually the upper one's a wood stove. And you can see with the wood stove going, it's, uh, it's cranked up pretty good there. Uh, We've got a nice high temperature on the, the body of the stove, a little bit less on the flue, which is, which is good. Uh, and then the building down below is actually the same building we looked at earlier. Uh, you can see, again, uh, this is an image created by thermal radiation leaving all the surfaces that are seen within that image. So you can see the windows are higher surface temperature than the studs. The studs are a higher surface temperature than where the insulation is in the wall. The roof appears to be at a fairly low uh, temperature here. Now the equation for radiation gets more complicated. Uh, it has to do with the properties of the two surfaces that are exchanging energy, uh, what are called the emissivity of those two surfaces. Some materials like, uh, like a flat black paint have a high emissivity. Some materials like a polished aluminum sheet have a very low emissivity. So that is definitely going to affect uh, the rate of heat transfer. Um, the, the relationship in terms of how those surfaces face each other, are they two parallel surfaces that are exactly parallel and let's say infinite in size, or are they at angles relative to each other? Uh, that, uh, F12, that shape factor, there are, in heat transfer textbooks, there are graphs and, and, and uh, formulas to calculate that shape uh, factor. Uh, and then the other thing that's different here, conduction and convection, the rate of heat transfer is directly proportional to the delta T. Here it's proportional to the fourth power of these, the two different surface temperatures. So things can, can change drastically in terms of rates of heat transfer when you're dealing with uh, the fourth power of the temperature. And, and I also wanna stress, if you're using an equation like this, those temperatures have to be in absolute 
temperature. Uh, so either Kelvin or Rankin uh, for this formula to apply. So what's a practical example of radiant heat transfer? Well, you can, you can try this out next winter. Just uh, put a t-shirt on, maybe a pair of shorts, and, and go sit next to a very large window on a cold winter night. And uh, make sure your thermostat is set for 70 or 72, so the air temperature is what most people would consider comfortable. And you'll find within a short time, you're, you're very uncomfortable. At least in, in this photograph, the, the right side of that, that uh, person is gonna be very uncomfortable. And that's because she's emitting radiant energy to that cold surface. And you have a higher delta T there. You've got a good shape factor. Um, you've got fairly high emissivities on skin and clothing surfaces. So uh, this, the point I want to stress here is that because your body loses about 50% of its metabolic heat production through thermal radiation, your body is very sensitive to its radiant environment. So even though the air temperature around you would could be considered normal comfort, let's say anywhere from 68 to maybe 72 degrees Fahrenheit, the surface temperatures are going to have a very profound effect on your comfort. And this is really the one of, one of the reasons that radiant panel heating has uh, increased um, because it, it addresses that. It creates warm surfaces that drastically decrease the rate of heat loss from your body uh, by radiation. Um, I also put in here, you know, we've talked about convection and radiation. They can be treated as independent calculations in a given situation, but in some cases, uh, it's practical to, to have a simpler formula. So we're back here to a pretty simple formula where uh, what we've done is we've created what's called a combined radiative and convective heat transfer model. And that value there of M, if you look down below here, M is, it says combined heat transfer coefficient, meaning it combines the effect of convection and radiation together. So we don't have to deal with uh, the more complicated math. And I put down for some, again, some practical applications. What would the value of M be for surfaces like a radiant floor, a radiant wall, and a radiant ceiling? And you can see the radiant floor, it's pretty easy to remember. It's about two. Uh, that would mean that two BTUs per hour would leave each square foot of the floor for each degree Fahrenheit that that floor surface temperature is above the room temperature, okay? Now, remember with, with embedded tubing or embedded wires in a slab, you don't have a perfectly uniform floor surface temperature. So we're talking about average surface temperatures here. Uh, you can see that goes down a bit for a radiant wall and it goes down even more for a radiant ceiling. That has to do with convection. A radiant ceiling does not produce much convective heat output because as air is warmed against the heated ceiling, it, it naturally wants to stay up against that ceiling. It doesn't want to circulate down into the room, uh, as opposed to a floor where, we're, where we are creating some uh, warm air above a heated slab and it is less dense than cooler air, so it's going to naturally rise. So you can see, again, from a practical standpoint, the position of the surface is going to affect its ability to transfer heat into a, into a room by a combination of convection and radiation. Okay, now we, we've talked about these fundamental modes of heat transfer. Let's get into something specific for hydronics. Uh, this is a very commonly used equation. Uh, it relates uh, a rate of heat transfer to a flow rate of a fluid and a temperature change in that fluid. And I've grouped together some terms over here in these parentheses. Uh, the 8.01 is basically to make the units on both sides of this equation come out the same. Uh, D is the density of the fluid and C is the specific heat. So when we change fluids, for example, from water to antifreeze, the value of D and C has, will change. They're, these are fluid properties. And not only do they change with the fluid, they change with the temperature of the fluid. So they are, they're functions. Now, specific heat doesn't change much. 
for water, uh, the density does change fairly significantly with, uh, with, within the temperature range that we work with in hydronic systems. So if we know a flow rate, we measure it with a flow meter, and we know a temperature change, we measure it with a couple thermometers, and we know the fluid that we're working with, be it water or maybe a 20% solution of propylene glycol, we can put those values into this formula. We can calculate what is the result, resulting rate of heat transfer. If, if this was fluid going through a boiler and the delta T was such that obviously the outlet temperature on an operating boiler would be higher than the inlet temperature, it's the rate of heat transfer from the, from the boiler heat exchanger to the water. Or if it's going through a heat emitter, it would be the rate of heat dissipation at that. Now, the graph that popped up over there on the right, that just shows the variation in density for water over a range of temperature from 50 to uh, 250 degrees. And it's, it's significant. It's significant enough that when you're trying to do precise calculations on heat transfer, like with a BTU metering system, you need to factor in this change in density. Okay. Now, here's another formula that pops up. 500 times flow in gallons per minute times delta T. This is the one that most people use in hydronics because it's pretty easy to remember 500 times gallons per minute times temperature change in degrees Fahrenheit gives you BTUs per hour. But I, I want to point out it's that number 500 is what you get assuming 60 degree water. If you take the density of water at 60 degrees, roughly 62.4, and the specific heat of water, which is for all practical purposes 1.0, and you factor those together, you get something like 499.6, and you round that off to 500. So this is fine for quick estimates. Okay, this would be fine if you know, you know, 10 gallons per minute with a 20 degree temperature change times 500 gives me so many BTUs per hour. But this is a more accurate formula when you're, first of all, when you're not using water, and even more specifically, when you're using um, uh, fluids that have significant changes in density and specific heat, depending on what their temperature is. Okay. Now, the other thing I want to stress with these formulas uh, is they can be used for what I call a what is required analysis but not for a what will be conjecture. What does that mean? Okay, mathematically, we can play all kinds of tricks with these formulas. We could make the delta T a thousand and make the flow rate very, very small, and we could get a given rate of heat transfer. The math just keeps working, but the physics doesn't, okay? So let's take an example here. We've got a, a radiant panel circuit. We've got 110 degree water, and let's say we've measured that value. And we've got, let's assume we have a flow meter. We know we have 1.5 gallons per minute going in. So of course, we have 1.5 gallons per minute through the entire circuit. And let's say we measure the outlet temperature at 92 degrees Fahrenheit. We've got measured values here, okay? We can take those measured values and put them into that formula. So what I've done here is uh, we start with the, the same formula up here at the top. Uh, 8.01, now 61.96 would come from this graph based on the average water temperature, the average between um, 110 and 92. And then 1.00 is just specific heat, BTUs per pound per degree Fahrenheit. Uh, flow rate, 1.5 gallons per minute. Here's our temperature change. So we get a calculated result. So based on measured values, we could calculate that that circuit is dissipating 13,400 BTUs per hour, okay? Now, let's take that same formula and just do a little algebra on it. Well, all we're doing is we're rearranging the formula. Let's say uh, we might know a rate of heat transfer or measure it somehow, and we want to calculate the delta T, okay? So it Mathematically, again, we can, we can do any legitimate algebra on that formula. So let's apply it here to a situation. What would the temperature drop of a water stream flowing at 0 0.5 gallons per minute have to be to deliver 50,000 BTUs per hour to a load using, an average, or using water at an average temperature of 101 degrees Fahrenheit? 
Okay, no problem mathematically. Uh, the rate of heat transfer that we expect is 50,000 BTUs per hour. Here's our uh, unit conversion factor. Here's our specific heat C. The density is based on that average water temperature of a 101, so 61.96 pounds per cubic foot. And then there's our flow rate in gals per minute. No problem. All the units cancel out to give, give me degrees Fahrenheit, but look at the number, a little bit over 200. How do you get a delta T of 200 degrees Fahrenheit in a hydronic system? Uh, you might say you can't do it. Well, there are possibilities in, in industrial systems where we're working with pressurized water, maybe in a range of 400 degrees Fahrenheit. It could go out at 400, come back at 200, we would have a delta T of 200 degrees. That's not something I'd recommend you do in a house though. Okay, so mathematically you can, again, we could play all kinds of numerical games with this um, and we can get numbers, but can we make the physical system behave based on what those numbers are? And, and in this case, I put down, this would be very difficult to do in, in any kind of a practical hydronic system for a residential or a commercial building. Uh, it might be possible in a very specialized, very high temperature, high pressure industrial ap application. That's not really what we want to um, focus on here today. So again, just because the numbers work doesn't mean that the physics is guaranteed to work. Now, again, what's a practical use of that uh, relationship between flow and delta T and heat transfer? Well, one that, that's very practical is measuring two things the rate that heat is moving through a portion of a system, as well as the total amount of heat that is moved through that portion of the system over time. And we do that with a, uh, with a heat meter. Uh, in the US, we might call these uh, BTU meters. Uh, heat meter would be a more generic term. Uh, we need three things to do that. We need the temperature of the heated fluid that is going from the heat source to the load, we need the return temperature coming back from the load so we can establish a delta T. And we need an accurate measurement of flow. So we need a flow meter. And here's a product that can do that. Uh, basically two high precision temperature sensors and special mounts that allow that sensor to be directly immersed in the fluid. So we don't have, we don't have the air caused by, for example, a temperature well or an air gap between the, the actual sensor and the fluid. Um, we even have calibrated uh, wires on, on these. These uh, sensors are matched with the instrument to make sure that the accuracy is there. So if we know the delta T, which we can measure with this device, and we know the flow rate, which again, we can measure, uh, the device itself can actually look up or within its uh, internal circuitry stores information, uh, the relationship of the de density and the specific heat of a fluid. So it can do this calculation and it can report what we call the instantaneous rate of heat transfer. And all that means is that at this moment, when we have this specific delta T and this flow at this moment, this is how fast heat is moving from the source to the load. Okay. Now that rate could vary over time. So let's say we want to vary or we want to keep track of how much energy has moved from the source to the load over a period of a month. Obviously, we're going to have changes in flow, changes in delta T. In theory, the mathematics comes down to this. this is getting into a little calculus now. You would, if you knew the flow rate as a function of time and the delta T as a function of time, and the density and the specific heat as functions of temperature, you could actually perform this, what is called an integration. This is, this is an exact summation of, of the combined effect of conditions that vary, but we would have to have some kind of mathematical function that describes what that variation is. Well, we, we don't really use this. We use an approximation of this, where we, uh, we might take a snapshot, let's say every 10 seconds, we look at the delta T and the flow rate, and we're gonna assume for 10 seconds that that flow rate and delta T remain constant. So over 10 seconds, we can calculate how much heat has moved. And then over the next 10 seconds, if that delta T has changed or the flow has changed, 
again, we, we, we register that change, but we assume that change holds constant for that next 10 seconds. And we keep doing that. So we accumulate these little incremental total amounts and then of course adding them all together we get a pretty close approximation of what the exact calculus um, equation would give us and we're going to be talking more about um, uh, the uh, btu metering in in, uh, in the next issue of hydronics so the question becomes are you currently utilizing or plan to utilize heat metering in your application simple yes or no question we're trying to get a, a feel for heat metering and what kind of interest there is out there in the application. So uh, yes, 27%, no, 73%. Well, we got to change that. <laughs> well, thanks for the... Actually, I'm, I'm encouraged by the 27% there. I, I think <laughs> I, I would not have guessed it would be quite that high. Heat metering hasn't been widely used in North America. Uh, there is a new ASTM standard that is soon to be finalized. I believe it's going to be finalized this summer. Uh, it's going to be an emerging market and a very good market. So uh, one to keep your eye on. So thanks, Woody and, and uh, Bob Wood for that poll. Let's keep going. Uh, so our next slide here is how, how does the supply water temperature affect the delta T? Let's say we're changing the supply water temperature based on um, heating load. Well, you, know, you, you can see on this graph here, when we have a design condition, let's say that's 100% heat output, all right, we have a supply water temperature here of 180 degrees on this graph. As we go to smaller percentages of design load, let's say we go down to half load, what this red line is telling us is that our supply water temperature can go down. Now, this is assuming constant flow rate, that we're not varying the flow rate. But obviously, if we only need half as much heat transfer, we can do it with half the delta T that we had under design conditions. And, and that delta T I'm referring to is the temperature difference between supply water temperature and the room air temperature, okay? If we go down to a quarter of the load, you can see it decreases even farther. Now, this is the basis of outdoor reset control. The concept is as the heating requirement of the building goes down based on warmer outdoor temperatures or whatever other conditions may affect the load, we can reduce the supply water temperature to our distribution system and still maintain stable indoor temperatures. And of course, the advantage there is that as we go to lower temperatures, many of our modern heat sources experience increased efficiency. ModCon boilers, Almost any kind of a renewable system is going to give you better efficiency at lower water temperatures. Um, now, the blue line shows what has to happen with the delta T between the supply and the return side of the distribution system as we re reduce our supply water temperatures. Now, think about this. If you were to surmise that the delta T stays constant, all right, that formula that we looked at of flow times delta T times, you know, the 8.01 D and C, that, that's essentially that 8.01 DC. Think of that as a constant, all right? So essentially it comes down to rate of heat transfer is flow times delta T. Well, if the flow is staying constant and the delta T is staying constant, it implies that the rate of heat transfer is, is constant. And we know that can't be the case here. So the delta T, between the supply and the return side of a distribution system collapses or shrinks as we go to lower and lower percentages of our design load condition. And at, in theory, at a no load condition, we would have a zero delta T, okay? If we, if we have a 70 degree room and we supply 70 degree water to our distribution system, we have no delta T between the air in the room and the water in our heat emitter, we have no heat transfer, okay? So as the uh, supply temperature goes down, so does the return temperature. Now, what happens if we constrain our delta T? In other words, we, we have some kind of control in our system that holds delta T constant. And again, this, this comes up as a question quite often. And we've looked at this and this is acceptable, this will work, but there are some constraints on it. Uh, one is that you're, you're working with a hydronic system 
pr probably a valve based zoning system. Now, by that I mean it could be zone valves, as, as the schematic shows. It could be thermostatic radiator valves. It could be manifold valve actuators. And I, I put another line in there. It could also be a primary secondary system with a circulator on each secondary circuit. In other words, when a zone shuts off, we have less flow, okay, and uh, less heat transfer. That's the first condition. The second condition I put down is low thermal mass. And that's because if we're using a delta T type control, we have to have sensors. And, and those sensors are the basis of changing the, the flow rate. And so the sensor has to react. It has to feel a temperature change. How quickly it's going to feel that temperature change depends on the mass of the system. If it's a low mass system, like a fin tube baseboard system, it's that change in temperature is going to be relatively quick, probably within a minute or two. If it's a high mass slab type floor heating system, that change in temperature could take many, many minutes. So for accurate control, we, we need to have sensing that is responsive uh, quickly. And then finally, and this is an important condition, this will work as long as we're maintaining a constant supply water temperature at the design load value. That means we've designed a hydronic distribution system around a certain supply water temperature at design load. Let's just say it's 180 degrees Fahrenheit for a baseboard system. What that third condition says is that's the water temperature that's always available to that distribution system, uh, regardless of whether it's January or April. All right, We're, we are, are not doing outdoor reset control with this strategy. When we have these three conditions, we can set a delta T, a reasonable delta T, and the circulator flow rate can vary so that that, what I'll call that constrained delta T, that value that we set on the controller remains constant. When a zone valve closes, uh, there's going to be less heat removed from the distribution system. That's going to be detected as an increase in the return water temperature. Less heat leaving the water means the return water temperature is going to be warmer. Our, our controller will detect that. It'll say the delta T is now smaller than what the set point was. It'll slow the flow rate down at the circulator and stabilize back to its set point and, and no problem. If, if another zone valve closes, same thing. The return water temperature would, would go up. The control system would sense that. It would reduce the pump speed to go back to our set point. And then the inverse of that is true. As we open a zone valve, uh, we would be taking more heat from the system. That's going to present itself as a decrease in the return water temperature. Uh, the sensors are going to detect that. It's an increase in delta T. It's going to increase the circulator speed and come back to our set point. That's going to work just fine, okay? But I, I do want to stress um, this third condition is important. I want to show you what, in theory, would happen when we, we vary the supply water temperature, okay? Let's say we're doing outdoor reset. And to do this, I just took a a piece of fin tube, 50 feet long, three quarter inch baseboard, uh, residential grade product rated at 600 BTUs per hour per foot with a 200 degree water temperature. And all I did is I, uh, I varied the supply water temperature and then I changed the flow rate to force a delta T of approximately 20 degrees Fahrenheit on that 50 foot. So the graph here shows results. These, these yellow points right here, and the, the orange line that connects them. Uh, for example, at, at just over two gallons per minute, that 50 feet of baseboard at 180 degree supply water was giving me uh, just under 20,000 BTUs per hour. And then as I drop the flow rate down, and again, these flow rates all correspond to um, 20 degree delta Ts, you can see my heat transfer is dropping. And it's actually dropping faster than what an outdoor reset line would would in theory require. Uh, the outdoor reset concept is that there's a proportional relationship there between how fast that supply water temperature goes down and what the rate of heat transfer from the distribution system is. Okay, The orange line shows that that rate of heat transfer is 
dropping off faster. Now the question is whether that'll be detected or not, whether that creates an uncomfortable condition. And that, that's a subjective question. It's hard to answer it. But I do want to point out that in theory, if we combine reducing the supply water temperature based on outdoor reset with a constrained delta T, that the rate of heat transfer drops off faster than it should based on the classic model of outdoor reset control. So again, delta T based control has its place as long as you respect those conditions, it should work just fine. Okay. Now, here's another question. Um, I've often kind of quipped that if I ever created a museum for North American hydronics, I'm gonna have a big plaque in that museum with the number 20 on it. Why, why, why put 20 on a plaque? Because everybody seems to, not everybody, but a lot of people seem to think that a 20 degree delta T is the right delta T or the only delta T that a hydronic circuit can operate at. And actually that's not true. You can have a wide variety of delta T's. So again, let's show you what's possible here. Um, here's a radiant floor circuit. It's representing 300 feet of half inch packs embedded in a four inch concrete slab with 12 inch tube spacing. So we, we've got a very accurate engineering model of this circuit. And we're going to supply with 110 degree water in all three cases, but we're going to vary the flow rate from roughly half a GPM to about one and a half and then up to a little over two and a half. So just like our previous example with baseboard, as we increase the flow rate, you can see our delta T in this first case where we have a relatively low flow rate, uh, about almost 26 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, now we bump the flow up by roughly a factor of three. Our delta T drops down to about 12. And if we really start blasting that water down that half inch tube at 2.65 GPM, we've got a small delta T. Um, and over here, let's see, uh, the temperature drop of that circuit is plotted here as a function of the flow rate going through the circuit. So you can see, in one case, we had a delta T um, a little bit over 25, and then I cut it off at roughly about seven or so, just to keep that blue line within the range of these, these uh, snapshots. And then the rate of heat transfer is this red line over here. Now, you might remember a previous graph. Remember, if I extended this all the way down, in theory, it would come down through this point here. But we're starting at half a gallon per minute and a certain rate of heat transfer. And you can see it continues to go up as we increase flow rate, but it's a diminishing increase, diminishing rate of increase as we go to higher and higher flow rates. So again, we're back to this trade-off. Higher flow rates produce higher heat outputs in a radiant floor circuit, but the penalty is, the, is a significant increase in pumping power. So if you want to create a radiant floor circuit where from supply to return side of that circuit, there's only, a, let's say, a four degree Fahrenheit temperature drop. You can do that. You're going to need a big pump, and it's, it's going to take a lot of pumping energy to do that. The floor surface is going to be more uniform, but the penalty you pay is that, is that higher pumping. So nominal numbers that I, I often suggest, if it's a residential application where what, I, uh, what I'm trying to achieve is what I call barefoot friendly floors. People are gonna walk around barefoot on the floor. You don't wanna have a huge variation in floor surface temperature. I suggest limiting the delta T to about 15 degrees Fahrenheit. If it's a industrial application, maybe a, uh, an aircraft hangar or a highway garage, you can go to a higher delta T. And people are walking around in, in work boots, so maybe a 20, possibly even a 25 degree delta T. The advantage of that higher delta T will be lower pumping power and smaller pumps. Okay, so it, it shows that this floor circuit can operate depending on the flow rate over a wide range of delta T. There's nothing sacrosanct about a 20 degree delta T. In fact, honestly, I, I'm not sure where the number 20 actually originated way back in the annals of American hydronics, but um, keep in mind that it's, 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 it's just a number. It's not necessarily the best number or the only number that you can have. Now, how about an example of a system operating over a much wider delta T? Here's a panel radiator where, again, it's an infrared thermograph, 
And over here on the right, you'll see a, a very significant difference in temperature. So what we try to do here based on these colors and the temperature scale, we estimate about a 40 degree delta T between the supply water going up here and then the return water coming back. And with a 40 degree delta T and water, okay, every gallon per minute of water flowing through that radiator at that 40 degree delta T is carrying 20,000 BTUs per hour with it. That's a very significant rate of heat transfer. In fact, there are houses being built today, 2,000 square foot houses that have a 20,000 BTU per hour or less de design heat load. So in theory, if you could create a 40 degree delta T on a hydronic system in a house like that, a one gallon per minute flow would satisfy the heating requirement of that house on a design day. Okay, are you currently involved with applications that leverage high delta T greater than 30 degrees? Um, another yes or no question. We'll give you a couple seconds here to, to answer that. I would say the panel radiator guys out there may be looking at systems like this or <clears throat> see, what, uh, see what the group here thinks about that. So question number two, and the answers are yes, 30%, no, 70%. Okay. Well, again, we're, we're going to talk about an application where uh, you'll see a high delta T where you can create it within practical conditions in a hydronic system is, is, a, is definitely your friend from a design and standpoint. You can do a lot with small pumps, small pipes when you have high delta T. Um, here we've got a conventional boiler. Let's say at design load, it's putting out 180 degree water and it's going to some type of a distribution manifold system. And we have PEX tubing coming from that manifold station going up to what we call distribution stations. Now, this is a, a Kalefi product. It's essentially a combination of a manifold, a circulator, and a mixing valve and a, and a hydraulic decoupler. Okay, so the, the um, dynamic uh, pressure distribution created by this circulator is uncoupled from the pressure distribution created by this circulator down here. And look at the delta T's that are involved here. We're sending 180 degree water out through that tube but because we're going to low temperature heat emitters our return water temperature and this again could be a cold winter day our return water temperature is 88 degrees look at the delta t between the supply tube and a return tube 92 degrees fahrenheit delta t so back to that basic formula we looked at at the beginning with a 92 degree delta t each gallon per minute of flow carries about 45,000 BTUs per hour, okay? So let's say that we're only trying to move um, maybe 50,000 BTUs per hour to this distribution station at design load. We could do that with just a little over one gallon per minute of flow through this tubing down here. And that could easily be accommodated by half inch tubing. So the again, the savings really start to show up when you get up into large commercial radiant systems. Um, uh, we've uh, written in past issues of Hydronics and, and I've written in other uh, publications about what's called a mini tube system, the idea of sending high temperature water out to a distribution station, doing the mixing at that distribution station, and then sending back much lower temperature water, exploiting that high delta T. And it can, it can literally save tens of thousands of dollars in piping costs. Uh, you're, you're, Instead of using, for example, two and a half inch or even three inch tubing, you might be down to one inch tubing based on much lower flow rates associated with a high delta T. So again, it's, it's one of those design gems that you keep your eye out for when you can create a high delta T, again, within reasonable constraints. Obviously, we're, we're working with a boiler here that can produce 180 degree water. Uh, with present generation heat pumps, we, we really don't have that capability. Uh, with solar thermal collectors on a, on a really sunny day, we might get a tank up to 180 degrees. We don't typically keep it there. So it does assume high temperature water to begin with. And that, that's how we get the high delta T, a high temperature source combined with a low temperature heat emitter system will give us that high delta T. Okay, now another concept we want to touch on, thermal equilibrium. Here's the idea again, 
every hydronic system attempts to operate at a supply water temperature where the rate of heat production is balanced by the rate of heat dissipation. Every hydronic system will achieve those conditions uh, unless a control action interrupts the process. And I wanna show you what you might consider after we're done a ridiculous situation, all right? Let's imagine we have a system with a 50,000 BTU per hour boiler, and we connect it to 20 feet of residential fin tube baseboard. So there's our system, okay? 20 feet of baseboard, and we just said that at thermal equilibrium, the rate of heat dissipation equals the rate of heat input. So the question now becomes, what water temperature do we need where we have this balance? And we're gonna make an assumption here. We're gonna assume that we have really strong piping. We don't have any pressure relief valve on the system, and we don't have any kind of temperature limiting controls on the boiler or anywhere else in the system. We've, we've done a really good job of putting this pipe together, and hopefully we're standing a few feet away from this when it operates, okay? So again, what's the average water temperature in that fin tube in order to achieve this? So you can do this calculation, and I, I did it for you. It's 420 degrees Fahrenheit. If we had 420 degree average water temperature in that baseboard, 20 feet of fin tube, residential fin tube, would dissipate 50,000 BTUs per hour, okay? Now, you might say, well, you can't have water at 420 degrees. Well, you can have water at 420 degrees. I, I don't know what the pressure would be. I'd have to look it up. Uh, it's high. It'd probably be in excess of 200 PSI. Uh, obviously, a lot higher than what would be safe or what would be allowed if we had a pressure relief valve on a system. And certainly, uh, boiler limit controls don't, don't go up to 400 plus degrees Fahrenheit. So what's going to happen in here is if we actually created a system and we had our standard high limit control on a boiler and our pressure relief valve on a boiler, one of those would interrupt this process before thermal equilibrium was established, okay? But that doesn't negate the fact that the system is trying to get to this condition. And we've simply interrupted it. We've intervened with control action which is good from a safety standpoint, uh, but it interrupts the natural process of what, what the hydronic system is trying to do, okay? So bottom line, that's why we use temperature and pressure limiting controls and systems. And quite honestly, there's a lot of hydronic, probably thousands of hydronic systems that if you removed all the temperature limiting controls and pressure relief controls, would go to unsafe operating conditions just based on how much baseboard they have, or perhaps it's a fan coil where the coil's all plugged up and we're not getting good heat dissipation. The system from a thermodynamic standpoint is still trying to reach this balance. Um, and if it weren't for those controls, we would have uh, basically a lot more headlines about exploding hydronic systems, okay? Now here's another situation. Um, let's say, I'll start with this, uh, it's a simple circuit here. Let's say we've got eight circuits. Each circuit is half inch PEX tubing, 350 feet long, and embedded in a concrete slab. So we've got a de defined heat emitter. And based on the, the tube spacing and, the, and so forth, uh, I calculated that to get rid of heat at a rate of 50,000 BTUs per hour, our supply water temperature into that manifold only has to be 99 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? And let's say we come along and we crank our boiler limit controller up to 140. The question is going to be, will the boiler reach the temperature that's set on that high limit controller? Now, there are people that would say, yes, I dialed it into 140, that's what the boiler is going to do. Uh, but think about this concept of heat dissipation versus heat production. Our boiler is, is the same boiler. It's a 50,000 BTU per hour maximum output boiler. And I've just stated that our distribution system can release heat at 50,000 BTUs per hour with a 99 degree supply temperature. So again, will it reach 140? The answer is no. Will it reach 130? No. Will it reach, if you really want to be a nitpicker, will it reach 100 degrees Fahrenheit? And the answer is no, it 
it's only going to go as high as it has to to establish thermal equilibrium, which we've calculated as 99 degrees Fahrenheit. So, you know, you don't have to pull the limit control off the boiler and take it back to the wholesaler and say it's defective. I, I set it for 140 and the boiler will only go up to 99 degrees. Um, think about that. It, this comes up a lot in diagnosing hydronic systems. The concept that that system is trying to find an equilibrium condition and does our control system that we've embedded on the on the the hydraulic part of and the thermal part of the system does it allow it or does it intervene and, and not allow it okay remember every hydronic system no matter how well or how poorly it's designed there is a condition that it will naturally try to seek it's just a matter of will it get to it before the controls intervene okay um i'm going to go pretty quickly through this the bottom line is as we increase the amount of surface area of our heat emitters, our water temperature requirement can, can go down. And today, our, our market, the, the global hydronics market, is certainly changing towards high efficiency heat sources, be it combustion technology, uh, modcon boilers, solar thermal heat pumps. All of these are going to operate better, produce better efficiency at lower temperatures. The implication is we need to add heat emitter surface area. However we do that, it could be longer baseboard, it could be longer panel radiators, it could be tighter tube spacing in our radiant panels, which effectively gives us a better heat emitter. But the more effective our heat emitter is, the more surface area we have, the, the lower our water temperature is. And it just, uh, these graphs are just showing a proportional, again, relationship between the difference between supply water temperature and rate of heat output, okay? Now, the, the question that comes up a lot, and I am going to try to move pretty quickly through this, how do we reduce the water temperature in a legacy hydronic system that was designed around high water temperatures? And basically two things you can do. You can try to bring down the building load by envelope improvements better windows, better insulation, better air sealing, all of the above, okay? Or you can add heat emitters to the distribution system, or you can do a combination of these, okay? Now, this formula is something you can use to ascertain what the change in water temperature would be at design load, your supply water temperature to your distribution system, based on a revised building heat loss. In other words, Q new versus Q existing, those refer to the design heating load of the building before and after what, what I call envelope improvements. Again, better windows, better insulation, better air sealing, okay? And I, I did a quick example here. If we could reduce a building load from 100,000 down to 70,000 BTUs per hour, so a 30% reduction in building load, we could bring a, and we assume that the existing distribution system required 180 degree water. Using that formula, we can estimate, we can bring that supply water temperature down to 147 Fahrenheit. And again, you can, you can use this formula as much as you want. Uh, the greater you reduce the load, the lower the water temperature is going to be. So envelope improvements should be something that we, we as heating professionals should should be aware of. We, we don't necessarily want to put, you know, to use an overused phrase, lipstick on a pig. You can go in and put a really nice hydronic system in a, in a really poor building, and you can make it work at high water temperatures, but it may, from your customer standpoint, be much more beneficial to look at envelope improvements as a better return on investment rather than trying to overpower a high load with, you know, with a bigger hydronic system or a higher water temperature. Now, uh, the other aspect of this is adding heat emitter. I don't want to take the time to go through all these steps. You can look through these in the PDF. Uh, the formula here is, is it's very basic. It allows you to determine how much extra heat emitter you need to get down to a certain water temperature. And I'll just summarize over here in this example. Let's say we had an existing building load of 40,000 BTUs an hour. We had 120 feet of fin tube in there. 
Uh, we, our delta T on our distribution system at design load, we estimated at about a 10 degree drop. Okay, so our average water temperature would be about five degrees lower than our supply temperature. And if I wanted to take that down to a situation where our average water temperature in the base board was going to be 115. So let's say a supply temperature of 120. Okay, that's a pretty drastic change. I would have to add, based on this calculation, I'd have to add 154 feet of fin tube to an existing 120 feet. And, and of course, I'm sure there's people out there laughing at this point. How do you do that? Do you start double stacking it? Uh, do you know, do you uh, run it around the windows like Christmas lights? You know, no, you just you just don't have this wall space to do this. So this can quickly answer questions, though. Is it practical to to take a system that operated 180 degrees originally and try to get it down to, let's say, a supply temperature 120? It might or might not be, depending on the type of heat emitters that you're using. Uh, as far as piping, okay, I'm going to suggest that we move away from series type circuits. You often find fin tube baseboard residential light commercial in, in series type circuits. Move away from it to parallel circuits. Uh, parallel circuits give you the ability to add zoning. Here's an example where I've cut up a series baseboard circuit and I've repiped it with some PEX tubing back to a manifold station. So now I've got four parallel circuits uh, instead of one series circuit. I'm using thermostatic radiator valves either on the baseboard uh, or built into panel rads. So now I've got four zones. Previously, I only had one zone with a series loop. Now I've got four independently controlled zones. I can also do that using manifold valve actuators, uh, same type of cut up the existing system where you can get access to it. And obviously, every system is going to be different. You've got to look at where where can I get access to intermediate points in that series loop, cut it, and then bring PEX tubing back to a manifold. But going to a parallel configuration versus a series configuration will definitely give you better results. Okay. And remember, if you're working with a conventional boiler, especially a gas boiler, and you're going to you're going to create a system that operates at much lower supply water temperatures. Uh, you want to make sure you don't create sustained condensation, flue gas condensation in the boiler. There are high flow capacity mixing valves uh, from Calefi that you can insert like this that basically will keep the boiler above the dew point, even though the distribution system is running below the dew point. OK. I think we've got just a few more slides. I'll jump through them very quickly and hopefully we'll have time for a couple questions. Um, this just shows common types of heat exchangers that are used, just different geometries. Uh, in the hydronics market right now, the, the plate type heat exchanger is by far the most common. Uh, brace plate units in smaller systems and in large systems, a uh, plate and frame. Same concept, just essentially a big difference in size and, and how the plates are permanently bonded together in a brace plate versus they are serviceable in a plate and frame. Uh, I do want to stress that the flow direction through a heat exchanger makes, makes a difference in heat transfer. The bottom line is simple. You always want the fluids going in opposite directions in a heat exchange situation. Opposite directions creates a higher average temperature difference between the two fluids over the length of the heat exchanger. What's what we call log mean temperature difference. That higher average temperature difference gives you a higher rate of heat transfer. Now the example I showed here with the tank with the coils in it, this shows a coil adding heat to a tank from some kind of a heat source. And notice the water is going down through the coil from top to bottom. That's uh, that's opposite the direction of natural convection flow inside the tank. The water over in this portion of the tank is being heated. It's going to expand less dense, more buoyant. It's going to rise. We have counterflow heat exchange. Over on the other side, we've got another coil that's extracting heat. Again, the flow uh, direction is important. In this case, we're going to the bottom first and we're working our way up through the coil opposite the direction of natural convective flow inside the tank. This is important. We, we see systems come in 
very expensive systems with these non-pressurized tanks and coil type heat exchangers where somebody's assumed it's just an arbitrary decision which way the flow goes through the coil. It does make a difference. And opposite flow directions, what is called counter flow, always produces this higher log mean temperature difference. If you have known operating conditions on a heat exchanger, the, what's called log mean temperature difference is basically the temperature difference at one end of the heat exchanger minus the delta T or temperature difference at the other end divided by the logarithm of the ratio of those two. So it's, it's a formula, if you don't use it every day, you probably wanna look it up once in a while, but you can show that uh, the log mean temperature difference for counter flow is always higher than with, with parallel flow. And then uh, uh, real quickly, uh, knowing, uh, calculating the rate of heat transfer across a heat exchanger, you would need to know the surf, internal surface area of the heat exchanger, uh, something called a heat transfer coefficient. That's going to take you some time to calculate because it depends on convection conditions. The convection con conditions de depends on the fluid, the viscosity, uh, the temperature of the fluid. Uh, suffice it to say, these calculations are possible, but they are kind of a grind. Typically today, we're going to use software like this to size a heat exchanger, online software where you can put in either required heat transfer rates and fluid temperatures and flow rates, what you know, and then it'll calculate the size of the heat exchanger that you need based on those conditions, okay? Uh, just terminology, approach temperature difference. Typically, it's the difference between the incoming fluid that's providing the heat and the fluid that is ex accepting that heat and leaving the heat exchanger. So let's say this is coming in from, maybe this is antifreeze coming in from a solar collector, and this is water that's been heated. The perfect heat exchanger would have a zero approach temperature difference. The water or whatever the fluid is leaving the heat exchanger that's absorbed the heat would be at exactly the same temperature as the fluid that has entered the heat exchanger donating the heat. That would require, in theory, an infinite heat exchange. So small approach temperature differences in the range of three to five degrees are possible. Uh, this is something I look for when I use the online software designing. Uh, obviously, the bigger the heat exchanger, the smaller the approach temperature difference is going to be for, for a given flow and, and entering temperature. But it's in, very important in solar and heat pump applications where we're trying to minimize what, what I call the thermal penalty of having a heat exchanger. Okay, we... Those, those heat sources are very sensitive to changes in temperature, so we want to minimize the effect of a heat exchanger between a heat source like that and a load. And then finally, you want to keep heat exchangers clean. Uh, this just shows some scaling inside a plate and frame heat exchanger that's been disassembled. Over here, we've got a highly corroded uh, boiler heat exchanger. Uh, water quality issues, okay? How do you keep them clean? Keep the dirt out. Uh, magnetic separators today, they can do both particle separation and, well, I'll, I'll refer to it as non-magnetic particle separation like dirt, sawdust, that type of thing, as well as any kind of iron-based particles uh, that are magnetic. And you can see one being flushed down right here. This is the, the blowdown valve on the bottom of a commercial magnetic separator. And you can see that black colored water coming out of there, uh, that magnetite. The other thing you can do is use demineralized water, especially if you're using antifreeze. Get the minerals out of the water before they have a chance to plate out on these heat exchanger surfaces. Um, how do you demineralize water? Well, there's, there's equipment to do that. I'm gonna recommend you take a look at Hydronics 18, which was dedicated to this whole issue of water quality. Uh, but the combination of dirt separation, air separation, and using demineralized water uh, is a, a really good start towards keeping those heat exchangers clean and keeping the performance where it should be. How are we doing? Let me just check here. Oh, we're one minute over. Um, <laughs> Bob, do we have any, uh, do we have time for a couple questions? Uh, yeah, there's a couple here that I think would be pretty pretty easy to, to get to. Uh, let me see if I can get this right. Uh, lower supply temperature will provide higher cycling in case of a conventional boiler is this question. Uh, not necessarily. Uh, it's going to depend on the mass of the system and the delta T 
that the controller that turns the boiler on and off at. Um, I mean, lower water temperature, uh, you know, is going to be required for things like a radiant panel system. Uh, I'm thinking maybe he's referring to outdoor reset control. In other words, lowering the water temperature of a maybe a baseboard system based on outdoor temperature. Um, actually, the, yeah, the delta T because it does decrease. You would get into more cycling. There are some controls on the market that recognize that and, and use a process called auto delta T or auto differential. What they do is they purposely increase the differential between when the controller turns the heat source on and when it turns it off based on how, how warm is it outside. Under design load, they might use a narrow differential, maybe four or five degrees Fahrenheit. Under very mild conditions, they might use is a 30 degree delta T. So uh, if, you're, if you're in a situation where you're using outdoor reset control and you're, you've got a fixed output heat source, using an auto differential type controller will, will reduce the tendency to have shorter cycles under partial load conditions. Got it. I think that's a good one. Um, yeah, I, as expected, there's some more questions about uh, you know, the Delta T pumping with the outdoor reset and high mass systems. Um, I guess, yes, if we we do cover that a little bit more in the hydronics issue than what you did in the slides here, as far as some more graphs and showing, you know, what can happen. I mean, I don't know yeah. how you would answer that question. You just got to look at the individual system and see what the, what design conditions are and what kind of temperature reset curve you have set on that boiler and see how the two lines match up or where they don't meet or when they get yeah. too far apart. Yeah, again, again when, it, when it's a matter of, you know, constrained delta T and you have a water temperature that's consistent at design load value, as, as zones open and close, it's just you're, you're changing the amount of heat that is, that is leaving the system and a delta T pump will respond to that. And how fast it will respond will depend on the sensors and the mass of the system. So, uh, from the standpoint of creating, you know, my interpretation of, of this and looking at the, the physics of it, um, the low mass system would allow fast response. As and I would have, I would personally avoid using outdoor reset control with a constrained delta T, based on what what the theory says should happen with the rate of heat transfer. Well, I think that's a good way to put it. I mean, we can certainly, if Josh wants to contact us, we can talk about it a little bit more, but I think that's the, the gist of it. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. I think the other ones you okay. kind of answered as we went along. So I uh, thank everybody for, for joining us today. And uh, uh, any questions we didn't get to, certainly we'll answer and, and get those back to you. So thanks, Siggy. This was a great presentation. A lot of information there to uh, to chew on. So bye-bye.